Welcome everybody to my talk about software archaeology. We want to learn from the landing on the moon in the 1960s. So the whole talk is about this computer. This is the Apollo guidance computer. Um, but first of all, I want to start with another question. Who of you did follow the Artemis program and the launch? Okay, so the, there's at least some spy, space enthusiasts here. Um, last year, the first new moon rocket was launched, the Space Launch System, November uh, 22. So we are going back to the moon again. And if I say we, um, I'm not affiliated with NASA. It's just a hobby uh, that I'm interested in space and the, the role of computers and software. Um, but, um, well, there are new missions uh, going on. And uh, this time, the Europeans, they are um, taking, taking part as well. So there's the European service module, which is built by Airbus, um, which is also well, flying to the moon. And um, actually, um, the first Artemis 1 mission was unmanned. The next one, in, which is scheduled for November 24, uh, is manned, or we should say also including a female astronaut. So, um, well, and the third one actually will land, land on the moon again at some point. The, ne the next one, the second one, does not plan to land. So how did, did this all start? Um, let's take a look back in, into the past. Uh, the first thing which which comes into mind is the Sputnik shock. Everybody uh, who, who has heard about that? So many people, okay. So it was the first real satellite. It's depicted here. And there are also stamps which celebrate this event in, in the Soviet Union. So the first satellite uh, wasn't launched by the United States, but the Soviet Union, so they were ahead at that time. And that was kind of a ch of shock for the Western world and the United States because, of course, it was the Cold War. There were obviously uh, civil usages of satellites, like we know today, for weather um, observations or for TV broadcast. But, of course, the satellite can also be used for military purposes. And that was the cause that, uh, that the United States quickly uh, started their own programs or intensified their own programs to launch a satellite. And this led to uh, the speech of John F. Kennedy, who became president in 1961. And uh, yeah, he postulated the goal that the United States should go to the moon in 1961. The speech was shortly after the first man went into space, and it was a Soviet as well, a Russian uh, pilot, Yuri Gagarin. Most of you might have heard uh, from him in, in April 61, so some weeks before this uh, special address to, to the Congress. And with this speech, John F. Kennedy asked the Congress to, to get the budget and the money to achieve this goal that the United States should go to the moon during that decade. And that was really a big task and a big challenge. And he later explained at a speech at the Rice University in Texas, which where, where most of the engineers or many engineers were, were taught, he um, explained why he did choose this uh, challenge to go to the moon, not because it was something which was easy or which uh, was, uh, well, really like, you know, foreseeable to achieve in this decade, but because it was really hard and because he wanted to make this challenge and to uh, get the, yeah, well, United, uh, the, the United States, the nation, behind this challenge to go to the moon. And of course, I wanted to beat the Russians in it. That was a political part of it. So it was a space race in the 1960s. And how did they do it? Actually, they started uh, some programs. The Mercury program, which was kind of the first epic in the, uh, in the whole um, well, uh, NASA missions, and it started in 1958. And the first task was to get an astronaut into an orbit around the Earth. 
So what Yuri Gagarin did. And the Americans achieved this goal, the first American in space, in May 61, some weeks after Yuri Gagarin was Alan Shepard. But he didn't orbit the Earth. He just made some, like, um, well, uh, parabolic, um, parabola uh, cycle. And the first American in Earth's orbit was John Glenn in February 62. So still, the Soviet Union was leading the space race. But the US tried hard to catch up, and finally, the moon landing was the thing they achieved first. The second big challenge was the Gemini program. So they, they had designs how to land on the moon, and these designs uh, consisted of two spacecrafts. So one which got to the moon and orbited the moon, and another one which landed on the moon and then flew back to the orbiting one. Um, and therefore, you needed maneuvers in orbit to rendezvous these two spacecraft, so dock, it, dock together, undock, and um, also they wanted to set their food on the moon, of course. Well, we, we didn't have this famous uh, small step for man, but giant leap for mankind uh, uh, citation otherwise. So they, they wanted to get their feet on the moon, and this is called as extravehicular activity. So they wanted to get out. And therefore, they had to develop space suits and all these things, life support systems, so that the astronauts could get on the moon without atmosphere and all things, or without air. So this was kind of an intermediate step um, to, to get to the ultimate goal, which was the third kind of epic, the Apollo mission, or the Apollo program. And the goal was clear and concrete, a moon landing and a safe return to Earth. And these programs were overlapping, and finally they fulfilled the goal which Kennedy postulated, the first landing was in July 1969, and, but it was really a national effort. So that was something Kennedy was right about, and they spent, at peak level, more than 4% of the US budget. Today, the NASA budget is around half percent. And, and they just, you know, they, after Apollo, of course, they downsized that a bit because they, they couldn't afford that. Uh, for, for that a long time anymore. But still, they won the race, they were the first. And now we take a look in, into the details a bit more. I already told you that there were two spacecrafts and they are depicted here. So this one is the orbiting one, the command and service module. It flew to the moon, orbited the moon, and one astronaut stayed in this command and service module. And the other two, they went into the lunar module, how it is called. And, uh, landed on the moon, and then this lower part stayed on the moon, but this upper part could go up again to the command and service module, they could dock together, and then they just discarded of this uh, moon, lunar module to fly with the command and service module back to the Earth again. Um, they, they tried to set up, or, or well, optimize the setup during several missions. And I want, want to give you a short overview. So first there was Apollo, uh, Apollo 7, uh, sorry, Apollo 7. Um, it only was a command and service module, which is nicely put here on the patch. So they had really nice mission patches, which uh, depicted the, the goals of the mission. Um, and it just went into an Earth orbit. So they just tried this module. They also had, for the first time, a TV broadcast, which was very important. We all know the images of the moon landing, and it was something which the Americans did, did uh, well, in another form than the Russians. So the Americans, they were very public and transparent. They always said, okay, we are going to start tomorrow in two days or whatever, and we have this and this and objectives we want to achieve. And uh, the Russians didn't do that. They just informed after a successful operation or mission. And we don't know if they were unsuccessful ones. So broadcasting was, was a, maybe the, the major achievement of that mission. Um, the next mission, Apollo 8, wonderful patch, 
you clearly see what it's about orbiting the Earth and then orbiting the Moon. So just go to the Moon, orbit, fly, uh, and go back with the command and service module only. That is the same flight profile, so to say, which uh, Artemis 2 will, will uh, fly. But it was also the first manned start of the moon of the rocket, which, which launched the two um, spacecraft, the Saturn V. The, that rocket is depicted here in Apollo 9, and you also see here in the missing patch the two spacecraft and the stocking maneuver. Um, and that was exactly what the mission was about, to test the stocking and rendezvous maneuvers in Earth orbit. If anything went wrong, it's safer to do it in Earth orbit, then you have a chance to get the astronauts back to Earth. Apollo 10, finally, was the dress rehearsal of the moon landing. So they made everything as they would do for the real moon landing. They didn't trust uh, the astronauts. The astronauts, they were test pilots, they were like heroes, and of course, Everybody knew the first man on the moon would get all the credit. Who was the first man on the moon? Neil Armstrong. You all know the names, right. And nobody, or maybe, probably nobody knows these three guys which uh, went on Apollo 10. So what did they do? They didn't give them enough fuel to, well, they had, could have landed, I think, on the moon, but they could not have flown back to the to the Earth and the command and service module. So they just didn't trust them because everybody knew, hey, if you are like 14 kilometers near to the moon surface and you have the chance to be the, the first man on moon, they would just do it, regardless what, what Houston would say. Maybe they would even say, oh, Houston, we have a problem, we have to land, and then, I don't know. So they didn't trust them. Maybe a good decision. Um, finally, there came Apollo 11, the Eagle, that was the code name for the Lunia module, the Eagle has landed. Um, there are some nice word plays, and most of you might know the movie about Apollo 13, where there, it, was, it has to be cancelled, or, well, an oxygen tank exploded, and then they had to use the Lunia module as a lifeboat um, to get back safely to Earth. So that was, well, a success in, in the movies, but not uh, for the mission. So as you see, there's kind of an agile planning. They, they have really concrete goals for each mission. And they, these missions, they were iteratively, iteratively designed. So with each mission, they had some objectives. Maybe they met all or they, they, they missed some, and then they planned the next mission. And also the, the hardware and software was well, iteratively designed, tested, simulated, and all these things. So let's look at the computer which flew us to the moon. I already showed you the picture. It's the Apollo guidance computer. This one is a computer, and this one is a user interface. So which role did it play? Um, actually, there were two of these computers. Uh, one was in the command and service module, and the other one was in the Lunar module. They had slightly different roles. So different programs, a different workload due to the, well, uh, due to the spacecraft, what, what they should do. And um, we see here the Lunar module. It's, it's a well, picture from the original handbook. And you can see that there are some tasks this computer had. So it got some input from radar and from the EMU's inertia, inertia measurement unit, so you can could um, compute where you are in space and where you are relative, relatively to the moon. With this landing radar, they could like, detect how many meters or foot we are away from the moon and how fast are we getting down. And then there was a rendezvous ra radar. This was used to dock to the command and service module again. Well, and of course, they also had a display, this disk key. I will show you a simulation shortly. So not going into the detail too much. And it also controlled the engines. A descent engine, well, if you're orbiting the moon and want to land, you have to brake, actually, that, so that you kind of fall down to the moon. And an ascent engine to go back to the command and service module. And some smaller 
control jets to control the position if you fly above the surface and, and search a landing site. It also controlled some, or yeah, well, displayed some data in the cockpit, not only with this disky, but other instruments. And you could send and receive data with telemetry from the ground control, from it to the ground, ground control in Houston. And of course, also the astronauts could override or control this computer input something, or had, like you uh, see here, some um, steering wheel. So let's dig a bit into the hardware, some facts and figures about this computer. Um, it wasn't big. It was only centimeters in size. So it's a bit larger than my laptop, but for this time in the 1960s, normally computers filled whole stories or rooms or whatsoever. So that was really the first like embedded computer which, which ever was invented and flew um, on something like a spacecraft. And it was also very, not very heavy or really light, you have to say. 32 kilos, also a bit heavier than my laptop, but, well, normally uh, in that area you measured in tons, uh, well, like all these mainframes which filled complete stories. And the weight was a crucial factor because the more weight your spacecraft have, has, the more fuel you need, which adds more weight, you can imagine. So they really designed this um, to fit into the spacecraft. A number which is comparable nowadays, we just heard, a, or I just heard a talk about um, green, green uh, coding, maybe that's important sometime. Uh, the power consumption was just 55 watts, because also in a spacecraft you don't have, you have some batteries and then they are, you can, cannot fill them up. Um, getting a bit more into the, the computer architecture, they had a 16-bit architecture that was really at the front, frontier in that time. 16-bit um, architecture, one signed, 14 data bits, one parity bit. So it was not that far away from nowadays computers, but, well, we have 64 nowadays. It has 16, but we have 50 years later, so it's quite a good uh, value. But 16 bits, if you think about it, that's really not much. You have an integer range from 16,000 plus minus, and if you make computations with that, there, there's an overload or a over, uh, override relative, relatively soon. Um, if you, if you are st um, striking, uh, there's a, the negative and the positive um, integer is the same. That's because there was a ones complement used. If you remember from your university, nowadays we use a twos complement. I can't explain that anymore, but you can look it up. Um, but integer was not that important because what what the computer had to be done had to be done had had to do was to well, compute the position in space and compute distances. And therefore, you needed a good numeric precision with numerical compu computations. And they actually achieved nine digits numeric precision. That's not really much. It's like a, an electronic calculator or something, and probably an old one. And uh, even to, to achieve this, they had to use a double word, so two of these uh, 16 bit words, which gave them 28 um, significant bits, and therefore they could achieve a precision of one foot, which is around 30 centimeters at navigation. So, if you imagine you are in a spacecraft millions of kilometers away, or many thousand, hundred thousand away from the Earth, and you want to dock with the, un with the other spacecraft, yeah, the Lunar Module, Command Service Module, to get back to Earth, and you, are, you only know your position 30 centimeters exact, that's the size of one of these hatches or airlocks, I, I would say, yeah, where you um, walk over between these two. So I'm, I'm not really sure if this was really the precision they, they needed, 
or just the one they could achieve with this computer and they said, okay, that has to be enough. Um, at least the, the astronauts, as told you, they were test pilots, they, they totally were um, or calculated or knew about that they could die in this mission. That, that was uh, not something they, they did think about, they just made these missions and therefore maybe it was kind of a, um, well, um, trade-off be be between the, um, what the computer could do and what the mission need needed. Um, for us programmers, there, are, there were also heavy constraints because you only had 2,000 words of read-write memory. That amounts to 4 kilobyte. 4 kilobyte to store data. I don't know, normal, normal Java objects ha have already more, I think. So that's really, really not much. And even worse, maybe, the read-only memory had only 30,000. 36,000 words, so your program code had to fit into this 72 kilobytes. Of course, it was assembly code and it was very optimized, but all these programs to fly and land and get up again and all these things, and even the routines if something went wrong, had to fit into the storage. So I think they really had a hard job to do to, to make this run. And I think Nowadays, we just couldn't, couldn't do that anymore with, with this technology. I, I'm, I'm really, I really think that we lost this ability to, to optimize code so much. Um, they, they also had other things to think about, the programmers. The length of the memory addresses were 12 bit, so they had the 3 bits opcode, 12 bit. You could only address 4,000 words but you had more, 36,000, remember? So what did you do? You invented the virtual addressing, which was called memory banking here. So you, with every like memory, no, read the value from a variable from data, store the variable from data, you had to think about, okay, where is it in memory? And do we have to make this memory banking, virtual addressing? And they had to do it all of their cells. Uh, we know this uh, in 32-bit architectures, virtual addressing was common as well, so it's not a new concept, but I think they applied it for first time here. And speaking of uh, the hardware further, the clock rate was only 2 megahertz. I think the first computer I bought, maybe 25 years ago or something, well, had already 40, 40 megahertz. And Today, we, we think in gigahertz and uh, the value actually doesn't matter anymore. Okay, but it was a special computer and that was just enough. They could send data to, to Houston, as I told you, and the da data rate was around 50,000 by, uh, bits per second. Um, or they had actually two data rates, 50,000 or 1,900. Um, it's not really... Starlink high-speed internet, but it's okay to update uh, some values if Houston has better data or to get some data to Earth to, to make good calculations. So let's take a look how this computer works. Um, I already showed you this uh, user interface. Um, it really does not really adhere to modern UX standards, I would say but it was really advanced for that time. You had some displays where the program number was shown and, um, well, values you could enter, a verb and a noun to tell the computer what to do, and some display. There are three values which could display it, and some buttons. But, okay, let's take a look. There's a nice web page. You can try it at home, and I will show you a short demo. That's not the right top. Okay. You don't see it, right? Oh, wait a second. Well, now you see it. Okay. So that's a simulator. Same picture uh, like the last one. So, so what can we do here? 
Um, I already started it up um, so that it calibrated itself a bit. And we now assume we are on Earth and want to start our rocket. So what I'm trying to do, I have to turn back a bit. Um, I enter a, pro an, uh, a command. So you g go here and enter verb 37. That's like a command. Enter, and then noun zero run. Enter, and now the computer is running. So what what did I tell the computer? Start the pre-launch initialization. We're on the ground. We want to launch the rocket, and you can see that uh, something is happening here. So the inertial inertial measurement unit is calibrating, and now you may have noticed that the program switched to number two. So the computer automatically gets into the next program. Program two is the major mode for pre-launch, and it currently computes regularly some values. So we are in the pre-launch, just before uh, launch. Well, that's not that interesting, so let's launch the rocket. Launch, right. So you see now, the MET is counting, the mission elapsed time, eight seconds into the mission, and the program has switched again. It's now the major mode 11, the program 11, that's the Earth Orbit Insertion Monitor. So a program which monitors if the rocket makes it into an Earth orbit. And you see here some values, three values. That's the only data this machine gets you, and of course, you don't know what these values are about. So you had to remember, the astronauts had to remember all of these things. And they needed to know, okay, verb 6, noun 62, is the first line is the velocity, how fast the rocket gets. And the second one is the altitude rate, how far from, from the ground the rocket is. And they had to remember that. And to make it, a bit more complicated, I can show you some other values. I can enter here another verb. So we could switch the display to other values. And now the verb 16 and noun 44 tell you which values that are. And for example, it's the last one is some time, a time to free fall. So when, when the free fall is reached. So you also had to remember the units of the data. So this is the time, this is, uh, I have to look it up, um, an altitude in, in feet per second or something. And uh, the astronauts had to remember all these things. And you could go back with the pro button, like program, and then the original values show again. Okay, the short demo. For the time, that was really a, a very great tool for the astronauts and the good user interface. But of course, you can't remember all these verbs and nouns combinations, so they had a quick reference card in the cockpit, like you may have with your IntelliJ shortcuts today. Okay, so how did the computer work? It had a real-time operating system, the so-called executive. And it was actually one of the first or the first real-time uh, real operating system at all. So they invented all these things. And it could handle seven processes ordered by priority. Um, it had to be done, so the programmers had to handle the multitasking. So if you are done with your task and stored every, all of the values and computed everything, you had to call a new job to get back to the main routine and get over the control to the next program. And they already also had the concept of interrupts. That's, there were 11 different interrupts. We know the concept of interrupts today as well. There were timer interrupts, uh, several. I only had this one, so for, that was the timer overflow and then the machine get running. Um, for some background tasks. And you had an interrupt if an astronaut pressed the key, like we have today. 
with the input and the disk key, there's another, well, nice fact about that. You could update the state vector, like where am I in space, how far am I from the linear surface, and all these things. You could update the state vector manually, so the astronauts could press, well, around 100 buttons, uh, like we saw in the, in the simulation. But you could also send this data from ground control with, with the telemetry uplink. And I think that might well have been the first robotic process automation because the uplink data exactly equaled the disk key input. So the, they just had these verb noun combinations and all these things. Apart from the executive, the, which was well, which had to be um, programmed in an assembly language, I'll show an example later. Um, they invented very soon a virtual machine, the so-called interpreter, to abstract from the hardware. Um, this assembly language, it was very tedious, and I showed you the memory banking for virtual addressing. And of course, you might imagine if you have to make these computations, where am I in space and all these things, you need some higher order language functions. And this virtual machine provided all these things, like vector and matrix data types, trigonometric and radix functions, index registers, stack pointers, and you could use the simpler addressing without the memory banks. You could mix the code from the interpreter with the executive assembly, so you could use both languages interchangeable. OK, enough theory. Let's take a look at the Apollo Guidance Computer in Action. If you have spare time at the weekends, I can totally recommend this web page. It's a whole mission in, in real time with all pictures and videos and audios. And uh, actually three missions, Apollo 11, 13, and 17. So let's take a look at that. Okay. Okay, so I'll show you a so short sequence. Ah. Okay, wait. Obviously, the audio is not working. I don't know if you can fix it. Yes, wait a minute. It should play sound, actually. <coughs> Is it the right device? Okay, sorry. Okay, everyone is awake again. I will get a short step back. Sorry. So, what did we see here? The audio is the original auto audio, so some of the static, but there was a program alarm showing. So we are some minutes before the actually first moon landing. Um, and 
Neil Armstrong saw that the, the disk displayed a warning that there was a program alarm and then he punched in some key code to display the alarm and read out 1202. Buzz Aldrin did the same, 1202, and they didn't have a clue what this program alarm would, wanted to say them because it was nothing um, they knew about. And so they said, told Mission Control, hey, give us a reading about this program alarm, what does it mean? And um, the answer is, wait, where do we have it? A bit earlier. It's okay, it's no problem. Okay, so they just continued the landing. We go a bit further. No, let me have a look. Okay, play again. Altitude 5200 feet. Okay, Alpha controller is going to go for landing. Rest for the control. Go. Control. GNC. Resurgent. Go. Capcom. Go. Altitude 42 Houston. You're go for landing. Okay, over 3,070. Roger, I'm saying, go for landing. 3,000 feet. Okay, Did you hear it? Program alarm? 1201. Roger, 1201. Roger, 1201. Okay, we're going. Same type, 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 we're Same type, we're going. Same type, we're Never mind, it's just a program alarm. Everything is fine, we can land. Okay, the astronauts did trust these engineers in, at uh, Houston. And, well, I have to go back to the slides. And they safely landed, as we all know. But what was this program alarm about? Um, actually, they had some kind of a similar, similar case in an earlier mission. And the flight director, Gene Kranz, he told one of the support controller guys, I want you to study all the possible program alarms and then in seconds give me an answer, go, no go. Can we land, can we not land, can, do we have to abort the mission? So that was his, his task and he had a big like, list uh, at, this, at his desk. And actually this, Alarm 1201, 1202, it arose in an earlier mission and the, the astronauts aborted the landing. And then the, they thought about, because this alarm came up for the first time, um, they get in contact with the software developers. It was an engineering team at, at MIT. And they did an analysis, what happened, what was this program alarm about, and all these things. And actually, the 1201 meant Okay, we have an executive overflow. That means, I told you, seven processes. What if an eighth process is coming? Well, the computer can't, just can't handle it. It cannot store eight. It can just store seven. We have a fixed memory. So it makes its priority. The top seven stay. The eighth one is just discarded. And of course, like we all know with good exception handling, well, we, we, we tell the user. So we tell the astronauts, hey, 1201 alarm, I just had too much to do. So I just throw away a process. Doesn't matter. We don't need it, I think. And 1202 was just the same with the interpreter. It, it could only handle five jobs in parallel. And if there's a sixth one, it just threw it away. And of course, they, they thought about how many processes do we need, and they tested it and simulated, and they were pretty sure that seven and five would fit all the objectives of the mission. But something, as always, goes wrong. And actually, later they, they discovered what went, what went wrong, and it was, the cause was the rendezvous radar. So there was a kind of a specification error and this one rule data, its power supply was out of phase with the main computer and therefore it sent some stale data. And 
well, then the computer tried to integrate the stale data into its own like model of, of itself and thought, hmm, that doesn't fit. And so it did a lot of computations. And then came the next data from the radar because it came continually. And that added up and then the computer said, oh, okay, I, I cannot handle all these data. And, um, but you might ask, why the hell do I need a rendezvous, data, a rendezvous radar if I want to land? I don't need it. And that's true. And that's why the computer was right. It said, hey, I need to land. And rendezvous, da rendezvous data, I don't need rendezvous data for landing. So I can safely discard these processes and these jobs and just throw the data away. And if I, well, if I make the rendezvous later, then I get new data. So what's it all about? And so everything went fine. The computer was just designed to handle these cases. The, why was it on then, the rendezvous data, you might ask? And it was actually switched on. The mission book told the astronauts to switch the rendezvous radar on because you might imagine you, you are on the moon landing, it's the first time ever in human history. Something went, went wrong, you have to board the landing then you have to fly back again and you just have one rocket and one try. So you have to be fast, maybe something is not working. You have to be fast, you have to make the rendezvous again with a command and service module to save your life. Therefore, the mission book said, okay, this radar is switched on, it doesn't matter. If it had worked correctly, it would not have overpowered the, the computer. And so they switched it on because if they had to abort, it was too tedious and too critical to switch it on and calibrate and all these things. It would have been too stressful for the astronauts. But, well, it had a design error and so the data were added up and produced these elements. But like this one guy in the control center uh, knew it doesn't matter, the computer will handle it. Of course, <clears throat> that was nothing they, they just like had, had invented from the start. This was something they learned through simulations and all these things. So when the Apollo program started, they didn't think much about the software. But during this nine-year program, they kind of invented software engineering. Actually, this term software engineering was coined by Margaret Hamilton. So I don't know, some women in the audience, yes? Exactly. You can say software engineering was invented by females. Um, she led the, she not only invented the term, she really led the whole team at MIT which co uh, programmed the software. That's a printout of the software. Um, I don't know, I hate it actually, but uh, it's a lot of software. And um, so she led the whole team at MIT with some hundred people. So big, big pioneer. And uh, well, if you go go back to your companies or better to to schools, tell them about uh, Margaret Hamilton. So maybe we get more more girls into software and IT industry. She was asked as well about this error, of course, what, what, what was going on, what what happened there, and she plainly said, well. Everything went fine. That was how the computer was designed. It was robust enough to handle these kind of errors. It was, it was being asked to perform more tasks than it should, but it prioritized and said an atom to the astronaut, I'm overloaded and I'm concentrating on the important tasks so we can safely land. And she did other really important um, achievements during this program. So I, I already showed you the user interface. And there's a nice story um, about this because Margaret Hamilton, she had also uh, children and well, they, they really worked many hours during the whole Apollo program. Um, and she often took her daughter into the office and her daughter played with this disc key, with a simulated one, of course. And she was playing around with it and Margaret Hamilton noticed, well, she crashed the system. How, how did she get that? How did she do that? And she analyzed and came to the conclusion that her daughter started this exact program number one we saw, 
the pre-launch program during the flight. So when the flight was going on, she, the daughter switched on the, the button for, hey, make the pre-launch. And then the software just crashed. And um, Margaret Hamilton went to her supervisors and said, well, we need to prepare for the situations. And they said, no, we have astronauts. Astronauts are highly trained. They don't make such errors. Well, they were wrong. Shortly afterwards, just in the same situation occurred. Somebody pushed the wrong program, the wrong button during a stressful situation, and the whole software crashed. And then she, could, she, could, uh, she, she got the people and the time to make the software as robust as possible. So mission to take away always take human errors into account when programming, even if you don't program rockets. Another success for, factor for, for the whole mission, I think, was the, the shared responsibility between the astronauts and the spacecraft and the mission control in Houston. So they could just ask, hey, what is this LM about? And they could tell them, well, um, it's not, not a matter. You can land safely. But the astronauts always had like the last word. The, the whole um, Apollo guidance computer worked like a digital autopilot. So it had a landing site program that it knew where it was and it tried to, to land there and fly there. And after all these hassle with the program alarms, Neil Armstrong took a look out of the window and saw, oh, well, our landing site is a rock and it's a crater, so we can't land there. And then he took over the manual control and like glided a bit above the lunar surface to find a better landing place. Uh, they had a bit, this was this jet command, a bit fuel for that, and he almost like totally uh, used that fuel, but well, they landed safely. Another thing you might do on your weekends, the complete source code for this Apollo guidance computer is on GitHub, so you can read it or program with it if you have some spare time. I, sh I show you a short example. Um, I, I don't really understand this code, I, I'm, I must confess. But it's, it's a starting point of this interpreter, of this virtual machine. So it's in assembly language, you see some, uh, well, higher order functions of the virtual machine, the interpreter, like a conditional call or go to, and then the um, statements of the assembly language, you have to code for that. So what do we learn? Well, of course, we don't learn this assembly language, but I think we, we learned that some of these methodology or principles that stay, they, they had quite an agile planning, and they already had an iterative software design. They made many situ simulations, and I think it was like version 99 of the Lumini, luminary program that was the one that landed on the moon, which flew on Apollo 11, and in the next missions it was continually improved. So I, I don't think that they had any version control, but um, they already optimated that. And of course, we, are, we have learned that we try to do our software robust and fault tolerant. The thing which really matters here, I think, you need some, well, visionary like Kennedy or somebody who is willing to spend that money on such a project. And you need people like Margaret Hamilton, which inspire their, their team um, to get that done. And of course, competition, competition is good for business, maybe, or for that. If there hadn't been this um, well, Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, they maybe wouldn't have landed on the moon. For us computer scientists or software engineers, the maybe most important principle is this abstraction and virtualization. Um, maybe I think today that we have too much layers uh, of virtualization and abstraction with virtual machines and Kubernetes and cloud providers, but still it's a very common pattern and a good tool to well, develop faster and better software. Thanks a lot for flying with me through well, rocket history. Um, if you want to contact me or have some questions, just get in contact. 
uh, normal day life, I'm working as an architect and consultant at VRD. We are a German company based in Cologne, Münster, and Dortmund, just across the border. And I don't know if we have, well, one minute left for, for a question, maybe. Thank you. <laughs>